Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Penario. I'm the president of the Rhode Island Alliance for Retired Americans. Um, first, I, first of all, I'd like to thank Karen and the Salvatore Mancini Resource and Activity and Resource Center for their hospitality in hosting this, this uh, great event. Uh, I'd like to recognize Rich Fiesta, who is the executive director of the Alliance for Retired Americans from Washington, Senator Reed, Senator Whitehouse, <laughs> Congressman Langevin, Congressman Cicilline, and George Nee, who's the president of the Rhode Island uh, AFL-CIO. Uh, also, we have some of the executive board members from the Rhode Island Alliance. Uh, we have uh, 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 John Lynch, who is a vice president. We have. Connie Donnelly, who is the recording secretary. Roger Boudreau, who is our uh, vice president. Bill Finelli, who is the treasurer. Uh, Where is uh, Jenny? Oh, Jenny's, Jenny's the one with the long hair walking around. She is the New England organizer for the Alliance for Retired Americans. And if I missed anybody, I apologize. <laughs> we are here today to to celebrate two great events in American history. First, the 79th birthday, August 14, 2014, the signing of the Social Security Act by FDR. Retirees celebrate this, the program that, that they, retirees celebrate the program that they contributed to in their working years and can re rely on for a modest benefits when they retire. Social Security is a smart, responsible way to prepare for retirement. A small amount of money, remember that FICA guy each week coming out of your paycheck? That's the Federal Insurance Contribution Act that came out of your paycheck each week after week, year after year. Then when you retired, the money was there for you. Some politicians like House Budget Committee Chairman Paul Ryan have promoted the ideas of turning Social Security over to Wall Street through privatization, cutting benefits, and raising retirement, raising the retirement age to fund $5 trillion in tax breaks for millionaires and corporations. There are better ways to strengthen Social Security trust fund that don't compromise this important lifeline. And there are definitely better ways to lower the national deficit, which Social Security does not contribute to. We can thank our congressional delegation for standing with us to protect, preserve what we have earned. Thank you for your support. Social Security is not a handout. The second great event, the 49th birthday, July 30th, 2014, of the signing of the Medicare Medicare Act as part of the Social Security Act by President Linda B. Johnson on July 30th, 1965. At the bill signing cer ceremony, which took place at the Newman Lime Truman Library in Independence, Missouri, former President Harry S. Truman was enrolled as Medicare's first recipient, and he received the very first Medicare card. Johnson wanted to recognize Truman, who in 1945 had become the first president to propose national health insurance, an initiative that was opposed to by that time, by, in that time by Congress. The Medicare program providing hospital and medical insurance for, Medi for Americans age 65 or over was signed into law as an amendment to the Social Security Act of 1935. Some 19 million people enrolled in Medicare when it went into effect in, 1996, in 1966. In 1972, eligibility for the program extended to, medic to Americans under 65 with certain disabilities and people of all ages with permanent kidney disease requiring dialysis or transplant. Medicare, a state and federally funded program that offers health coverage 
to certain low-income people was also signed into law by President Johnson on July 30, 1965 as an amendment to the Social Security Act. Again, we can thank our congressional members for standing with us to protect, preserve what we have earned. Thank you. We as, as senior citizens and retirees must fight to protect, preserve, and increase these very important programs now and in the future. Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce Rich Fiesta, the Executive Director for the Alliance for Retired Americans. Rich. Thank you, John, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'll be brief as the only non-Rhode Islander here today, but I will say as a partial Italian-American, it's always great to be in Providence, Rhode Island, and especially in North Providence. Uh, the food looks good, too. Uh, as John mentioned, we're here uh, to celebrate two great programs that have kept millions of seniors, and actually through history, tens of millions of seniors out of poverty and in some of the best health possible through the 79th anniversary this year in August of Social Security and last month in July, the 49th anniversary of Medicare. So we at the Alliance for Retired Americans are getting ready to have two big celebrations in 2015, the Golden Jubilee, the Golden Anniversary of Medicare next July and then the 80th birthday of Social Security next August. And you cannot think of two better programs that have been created of, by, and for the people than these two programs. Because these are our programs. We contribute to them. For Social Security, it's our contributions, as John mentioned, through work, and our employers' contributions that go into the Social Security Trust Fund for those guaranteed benefits that we expect upon retirement. Uh, it's our money. Our money that we put in, our employers put in, it goes into the uh, Social Security Trust Fund. The employees at the Social Security uh, Administration, we, they have a great table and a representative here today, they're paid out of the Social Security Trust Fund with our money. So when folks in Washington say, we want to privatize it, we want to give it over to Wall Street, we, all we want is uh, to take a couple percent in fees, uh, for example, that's our money that we've earned, and it's a hands-off uh, situation for us and we should continue it that way and we're especially proud that you in Rhode Island have a congressional delegation that knows this and stands up and fights for it uh, every day as well not only through their votes but through legislation that they've worked on and that they've sponsored I mean Senator Reid for example both in the House and the Senate uh, through his years uh, has been there with us uh, we do an annual voting record uh, every year and Rhode Island uh, is the only state that has its entire delegation in the House and the Senate at 100 percent voting for retirees and senior citizens. So thank you. Yeah. And we don't grave on a curve. Uh, these are very oftentimes tough votes to do, uh, but they are with us uh, every day. Senator Whitehouse is, was, is one of the co-founders of the Senate Defend Social Security Caucus. When that, you remember this guy named Paul Ryan? He was on TV a couple years ago when he tried to run for vice president. I mean, he's the guy who is the budget chief in the House that has been trying to make the Senate uh, vote on things like turning Medicare into a voucher, privatizing Social Security. Senator Whitehouse, Senator Reid also belongs, one of the co founders of a, of a caucus of senators to stand up and defend Social Security. Uh, Congressman Cicilline, uh, in his first term, got a petition amongst the House members to stop something called the chain CPI under Social Security, and I know he'll talk about that later, but it was a backdoor way to kind of cut Social Security by cutting your COLA, by cutting the formula. And seniors know they need every penny of that COLA, and what, two, three years ago, how big was your COLA? It was zero, that's right. Uh, but there were some folks in Washington that actually want to cut it from zero uh, when it was a couple years ago. And Congressman Cicilline stood up, got well over half his own caucus to sign a uh, letter, and actually the White House backed down from it, uh, and we've made other people afraid now to vote uh, on cutting 
the chain C or, uh, cutting benefits by implementing a chain CPI. Congressman Langevin, also very important with us as well too. He's co-sponsored uh, a bill that would help the trust fund by raising the earnings cap on Social Security. A lot of people don't know that not everyone pays into Social Security on all their income. Right now it's $117,000. So if you make over $117,000, you don't pay into Social Security uh, anymore. So that's kind of a tax break loophole for, uh, for about the top three, four percent. And if we take away that loophole, because everybody pays into Medicare on every dollar, uh, we can fund Social Security, make it stronger, and we can actually increase some benefits uh, as well, too, if everyone was paying a fair share into Social Security. So we're here today to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you uh, to your delegation uh, as leaders both on Medicare and Social Security. And Rhode Island actually has a history of being on this as, as well. As John mentioned, you know, Medicare was not an easy fight. Uh, President Kennedy actually first proposed it, and it went through two or three Senate votes where they couldn't break a filibuster. And one of the leaders early on was a Rhode Island congressman from the 1950s and 60s named Amy Ferrand, and he was one of the first people in Congress to actually introduce a piece of legislation that eventually uh, evolved into Medicare. So Rhode Island has a great history and tradition in defending programs for older Americans like Social Security and Medicare. And today we're here from the Alliance to say thank you for the members of Congress who you're sending and happy birthday to Social Security and Medicare. Great to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's uh, really an honor and a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank you for the tremendous leadership that you've shown pulling together all of the uh, union retiree organizations under the umbrella of the ARA. John sits on the executive board of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO in that capacity and has been tireless in his efforts. I want to um, do a few facts before I, I, I should do a disclosure. I know it's hard for you to believe, but I just joined Medicare this year. <laughs> I signed up because they told me I did. I got my badge on today and I love Medicare, so, uh, you know, onward and upward. But I want to put this in some perspective. In Rhode Island, 219,000 people are collecting Social Security. $248 million a month are going into the Rhode Island economy from the people collecting Social Security in Rhode Island. SSI, 32,000 people, $16 million a month. And Medicare, 188,000 people, $1.8 billion into the Rhode Island economy. I'll put that in some perspective. We are hopefully coming out of a very difficult economic time. And I would argue that the difference between a full depression, which we could have had, and just some tough economic times that are getting better, is partly responsible or largely responsible to the fact that that kind of money, and people have that kind of economic support to put back into the economy and support themselves as a result of both Social Security, SSI, and Medicare. We would have had, in my opinion, a full depression like we did in the 30s if these programs didn't exist. And it is the leadership of our congressional delegation, and they're sticking up for the average working person, for the retired person, for the elderly, for the disabled, that have made this possible. I have a very simple solution to all the economic and political problems in our country. And it's sitting right at the front table. If this country could elect a congressional delegation like Rhode Island's, we would be going forward dramatically. We would be making a lot of progress. We would have no gridlock. And the standard of living would, of people would go up tremendously. The fact that all four of them are here today at this very important celebration shows the respect that they have for these programs and for you. 
This is the best congressional delegation in the United States of America, and we're honored that they're here with us today. Thank you very much. My name is Jim Parisi. I'm a field rep with the Rhode Island Federation of Teachers and Health Professionals, and I'm vice president of the Rhode Island Labor History Society. On behalf of our president, Kathy Collette, um, Matt and Linda are all, and all of our executive board members, uh, thank you for coming here today uh, to celebrate labor, celebrate our history, and do what everyone ought to be doing in this country, which is honoring our, our, our forefathers who struggled so much to give us the lifestyle we now enjoy. The Labor History Society has come here for several years now. Uh, this is an important spot. Uh, where we recognize some past struggles going on as it relates to improving the lives and the working conditions of working people. Uh, this was a site of a massacre that Pat Brady is going to talk about, and, and it's so important that we're here today, uh, which is the 80th anniversary of the 1934 textile strike in which people died here and struggled throughout the country uh, trying to advocate for people who were poor, who were destitute, and who were in, uh, in the fifth year of an economic depression and couldn't find a way out other than coming together and working uh, for their own betterment. Pat Brady is a retired electrician, uh, close to four decades of, of uh, work with IBW, uh, Local 99. He was very active in education uh, when he worked for the union. He was a national leader in uh, safety and health training. And more important than all of that, he's maintained his activism with our society. He's maintained his interest in labor history. He gives of his own time promoting labor history. Most importantly for us, every year when the Rhode Island History Day uh, has a judged competition of secondary students, Pat goes out, takes a look at what student projects are going on, identifies the ones related to labor history, and then cuts all those kids a $100 check in recognition of their, their work. Thank you for that. Last year, uh, Pat was uh, prepared to give, uh, give this talk and, and we had to cancel because of inclement weather. A few of us came here anyhow. We got a little bit of a preview uh, and, we're, and we're pleased to have Pat here today. Uh, and before I go on, I just want to uh, recognize, uh, I'm so pleased and we're also pleased to have our, our congressman from this area, David Cicilline, joining us today. And as we stand in Central Falls, thank you, Mayor uh, Jim DeOsa, for, uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, and we have a candidate. Uh, there's always a candidate uh, a week or so before a primary. Seth Magaziner, thank you for joining us this morning. With that, Pat Brady. Thanks, Jim. Cell phones? You get detention if the cell phone goes off. Uh, good morning, sisters and brothers, and happy Labor Day. Uh, before I get started on my talk, before I get started on my talk, uh, I'd like to mention the fact that we have four places along this road with balloons, black balloons next to them, and they represent spots in the graveyard that uh, were in the the newspapers back in 1934 where we were able to use the gravestones as identifying markers of actions during the riot. So on the way out, we're, we're going to have uh, Labor Society people there as uh, docents, I guess, to show you what happened. So if you're interested in it, you might want to try it. There's, there's four of them right out, along down the road to the very end. The last one's right on the corner. OK, let me get started then. It is a privilege being assigned to give our Labor History Society's annual Labor Day talk here at the Moshasic Cemetery. And the nicest part is that the society lets its speakers pretty much decide what they wish to say and how they want to say it. And I always did go for that hands-off managerial style. <laughs> that being the case, we decided to take you all back to that September in 1934, 80 years ago next Wednesday, an attempt to put a human face on what happened the week after Labor Day, right here where we're all standing and sitting today. I'd like for us to consider just who were those mill hands who decided to dodge picketers and report for work at the sales mill complex just around the corner from here on Walker Street. 
Who were the picketers who tried so desperately to stop those mill hands from doing so? What was the story with the Central Falls cops and the state police and the state sheriffs and his deputies? What went through the minds of the National Guardsmen when they were brought in to restore order? What influenced Governor, what, what influenced Governor Theodore Francis Green to respond the way he did? And especially, who were Charlie Gazinski and Billy Blackwood, the two individuals who were killed by Guardsmen's bullets here in Central Falls and Leo Rouette and Jude Kudamash, who two uh, others who met with similar fates on that same day up in Woonsocket. I only mention Leo Rouette and Jude Kudamash out of respect because I found out soon after I started my research for today's talk that the story of what happened in Woonsocket on that same date will have to wait to be told on another Labor Day. What happened here in the cemetery takes up all of my presentation today. Different unions were in competition for Rhode Island's textile workers in 1934, with no single one dominating. There was the American Federation of Labor's United Textile Workers, the UTW, strong here in the Blackstone Valley. The Amalgamated Textile Workers, the ATW, composed of American Federation of Labor dissidents and remnants of the Wobblies, and which was big in the Patuxent Valley. The Independent Textile Workers, which seceded from the American Federation, Federation of Labor and its United Textile Workers a few years earlier in 1931, and that was in control up in Woonsocket and adhered to a more industrial, mill-wide unionism. And then there was a communist-affiliated National Textile Union Workers, the NTW, with Ann Burlack and Larry Spitz, and others of their leaders urging picketers to shut down the, mails, the sales operation. It was still a player, but it had been pretty much marginalized after getting knocked around in some earlier labor, really hard labor battles in the 20s. So you had the United Textile Workers, the Amalgamated Textile Workers, the Independent Textile Workers, and the National Textile Workers. And they pretty much all hated each other. They had deep philosophical differences which eliminated any chance for them to form a united front in 1934. The United Textile Workers strike leader even went on record as advising his members, quote, not to tolerate or have anything to do with the communists who have invaded the Blackstone Valley area, end quote. Although the majority of Rhode Island's textile mills were unionized in 1934, this sales finishing complex among the largest textile plants in the state was never successfully organized. It was established in, 19, in 1847 by William Sales, who built an entire village around his 30-acre facility for his workers to live in. Early on, the company set up a paternal system of sales workers clubs and sales discussion groups. A sales team played against other mill workers in the Pawtucket and District Manufacturers Baseball League. There was a sales men's club, a sales men's bowling league, a sales women's bowling league, a sales music society featuring a sales band and a sales chorus, a sales fire station, a sales library, a sales newspaper, a sales school, a sales church, a sales post office, and the village even had its own sales Boy Scout troop. It employed a workforce of 3,000 during its heyday in the 1920s, which was made up mostly of workers with English, Scotch, and Northern Irish backgrounds, who were being paid at wage rates with, that were among the best in the state. These sales workers were content with their lot, they were loyal to their will, and had no disposition whatsoever to join the forces, join forces with the strikers. Sales ownership, needless to say, was fiercely anti-union and had no intention of having its operations shut down or being forced to bargain with the union. All of these factors made halting production here at sales the main focus of strike leaders. As those of us who have been out on strike and have walked picket lines over the years know, and I see more than a few of the usual suspects as I look out here, the purpose of any strike is to shut down business until you can get a working agreement. You have to keep the employees from reporting to work, and as many of us have learned, and often the hard way, if you can't do that, your chances of winning are slim. The common disgust that the indus industry barons have always had for bargaining collectively with their workers, something that they all seem to share, stands in contrast to their fondness for belonging to business combinations that enhance their own causes, what we can call unions against unions, if you will. And in 1934, every aspect of textile work was guided by principles, or the lack thereof, that emanated from the likes of the Cotton Textile Institute, the Cotton Textile Industry Committee, the National Association of Cotton Manufacturers, the American Cotton Manufacturing Association, the National Association of Wool Manufacturers, the Silk Manufacturing Association, the Wool Institute, the Silk Association of America, and so on. Groups whose collective power cannot be overstated. 
Leading up to the troubles here, there was a huge oversupply of inventories after World War I, and the industry associations chose to squeeze their workers as much as they possibly could in order to address the problem. As bad as things were in the late 20s, and they were very bad, they only got much, much worse when the Depression kicked in, with the business groups transferring new miseries onto the backs of their workers. Their main weapon was a stretch-out, which involved increasing the number of looms assigned to each textile worker. The companies also engaged in limiting breaks, paying peace rates, and hiring more bosses to keep factory hands from slowing down or talking, even. The mills adopted scientific management processes, introduced company union, blacklisted, hired well-placed rats and workforce spies, and they introduced the Mohawk Valley formula, a strategy for controlling the news of the strike while coordinating public sentiment against the strikers. Are there any brothers and sisters here from the Providence Journal? Gee. <laughs> I was gonna have them pay attention. I was gonna have them pay attention to the rest of this. Rather than reporting the general complaints of 376,000 strikers up and down the East Coast, the journal portrayed management as good Samaritans, just trying to help their devoted workers avoid the evil teachings of organized labor. Work unrest, much of it directed specifically at the stretchouts, was already responsible for violent job actions throughout the East in the 1920s and the early 30s. And the general strike called in September of 1934 by the American Federation of Labor's United Textile Workers for its locals in 208 cities, towns, and mill villages was aimed at shutting down the entire United States textile industry. The strike lasted 22 days, and at its peak, over 400,000 mill hands in New England, the Middle Atlantic, and the South were caught up in it from Maine to Alabama. A new weapon was successfully introduced, the Flying Squadron, which featured fleets of cars and trucks that would race from mill to mill, closing one down while urging workers to join with them as they drove on to shut down the next. But what made them think that a general strike could succeed in 1934 when all earlier post-war efforts had failed? The impetus came from the misguided faith that workers and union leaders had in Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal National Industrial Recovery Act. They believed that it allowed them a voice in determining their wages, hours, and working conditions through union recognition as a trade-off for allowing employers temporary waivers from antitrust prosecutions. But not only did the National Recovery Administration, the NRA, which was the heart of the National Industrial Recovery Act, provide no floor for workers' wages, no ceiling for their hours. It also set up industry regulatory agencies, the Cotton Code Authority, the Silk Code Authority, and the Woolen Code Authority, which were controlled by business to the complete exclusion of labor, and with totalitarian power to settle all National Recovery Administration disputes as they saw fit. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m. Good evening, and welcome to the Institute's summer series of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney. 
Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance and interest to working Rhode Islanders. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition of our summer series. Good morning, everyone, and uh, happy Labor Day. It's uh, wonderful to see uh, so many people out here when you could be out doing a million uh, other things, like going to the beach or having a picnic or whatever, and I'm sure you'll be doing that afterward. Um, for the last several years, uh, we've been coming out here in order to celebrate, uh, commemorate, really, uh, the deaths of several uh, textile workers uh, who were shot down in Woonsocket and here in uh, Salesville. And you can still see those bullet holes in a couple of the uh, uh, headstones. I was doing a little uh, historical research, and uh, we always say that the Labor History Society began in 1987, which it did. And yet uh, I was able to find a picture in 1984, on the 50th anniversary, where we were all outside the gates bringing a wreath here. And uh, what's made it different in the last couple of years is thanks to the uh, wonderful effort of one of our youngest members of the Labor History Society, Ryan McIntyre, also the best dressed of us. Um, you'll get over that as you get older, Ryan, don't worry. Um, Ryan's the one who went through all the uh, trouble of getting the specifications for the granite, uh, for the plaque, and uh, for making arrangements uh, to have this uh, on Labor Day. And I think we need to do something like this to remember where we came from for far too many people have had a good life while forgetting that it was on the backs of a lot of other folks that came before us. And we never want to forget that because when we forget it, the media will forget it and we'll be zero. And it's tough enough under any circumstance today. Anyway, my name is uh, Scott Malloy. I'm still a secretary treasurer of the Rhode Island Labor History Society, but not for much longer. No more uh, envelope stuffing and uh, all of that stuff. Thank God I'm getting carpal tunnel syndrome after 50 years of this. But um, my job really today is uh, just to introduce a, a couple of folks. And uh, after we have our uh, main speaker, uh, Mary Lee and Bob are going to play uh, some music, including a song uh, that Mary Lee wrote uh, particularly uh, for this event, and it really is uh, touching and, and beautiful, and I think you'll really enjoy it. This won't be a long uh, service, so uh, don't get nervous. Uh, but with that, I wanted to uh, uh, bring up uh, Ryan McIntyre. Actually, Ryan, you look a bit like a funeral director today, and uh, uh, if you happen to see him looking you up and down, you know, and he's writing figures down, you know, six feet, uh, be careful. But... Um, uh, Ryan, as I mentioned, is the one who, who, who put all of this together, and that's why I'm so uh, optimistic about the future of the Labor History Society, that we do have people uh, like Ryan and a number of others uh, who are willing to take up the flag as the rest of us start to lay it uh, uh, down. And so uh, Ryan, who's a, uh, a school teacher, uh, and uh, I imagine your students are getting a brand of history that they don't get in a lot of other places. So uh, Ryan's going to come up, uh, introduce our uh, main uh, uh, speaker uh, of the day, Maureen Martin. And after that, uh, Bob and Marilee will be singing. And if any of you have any comments uh, when we're finished with that, you're more than welcome to speak uh, as well. Ryan. Good morning, citizens, guests young and old, or as we say in the labor community, brothers and sisters. We gather here today to remember an event that took place over 78 years ago on this very sacred and holy ground. In September 1934, the Inayo Textile Workers orchestrated a general strike which effectively closed down most of the country's textile factories. The struggle engulfed the Blackstone Valley region and the nation. The remnants of the Salesville bleachery community and conflict still remain to this very day. This cemetery became a battlefield. People died and were injured in this very area. Bullets, bricks, and tear gas were in the air. In fact, so much tear gas had been used that women and children crouched fearfully 
in their nearby homes from the effects of the riot gas. We gather here at this memorial and honor those who gave their lives so that we could pursue our happiness. I would like to take a brief minute and pause and have a moment of silence for those four individuals who lost their lives during that very turbulent time. Today, we find ourselves in a political and economic haze that makes it difficult to reflect on our labor and ethnic heritage, both as citizens and as a community. The labor movement has helped build and sustain this great country of ours. The early colonists fought back against the British Empire from the floor of a Union Hall in Philadelphia. The American staples of the weekend in the eight-hour workday was not just given a grant to us. We did what we do best. We sweated, bled, and worked for it. The Rhode Island Labor History Society hopes to celebrate that heritage and thus illustrate that the stars and stripes do exist within the labor movement. Also, we wish to document the trials, tribulations, and fight for quality of life working people fought for and continue to fight for in Rhode Island. We recently hosted our 25th annual banquet and have one of the largest historical societies for labor in the country. If you desire or have a desire to celebrate and popularize working class history, then you are encouraged to join the Rhode Island Labor History Society. Um, I wish to thank the following people and organizations who have helped make this program possible. Uh, George Bordman and the Massachusetts Cemetery Corporation. I'm not sure if George is still here with us. Uh, I, just a little round of applause. Um, working Rhode Island. Um, AFL-CIO, Institute for Labor Studies and Research, the president of the Rhode Island Labor History Society, Kathy Collette, who is sitting right there, our brothers on the fire department who helped power this right up. I wish to turn the program over to someone who is in the fight today. In 2009, she was the first woman ever elected to serve as the Secretary Treasurer of the Rhode Island AFL-CIO. She currently serves as a member of the Rhode Island chapters of the United Way and Salvation Army. Her most notable work on behalf of the Salvation Army has been as the organizer of the very successful Rhode Island Labor Union Kettle Day, where she raised record amounts of donations for the Christmas Kettle Drive. I wish to welcome Maureen Martin to the program at this time, please. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to take a minute before I start to tell you, do not get distracted by this chair over here. <laughs> this is my imaginary friend who hopefully will make my day today and tell me if I miss anything in my, uh, in my talk. I don't... I'd also like to take another moment to thank Ryan McIntyre, who has done so much. It really hasn't been just about today. He really has been working for the last three years and has made all of this happen, and this is a huge part of what we stand for at the Rhode Island Labor History Society. So thank you again, Ryan. So we're here today, the first Monday of September, Labor Day, a national day of celebration brought to you, by the way, by the labor movement. Uh, a day set aside to celebrate working men and women who built this country brick by brick and who make this country work every single day. September 3rd, 2012 should be remembered as a beautiful sunny day. I know the sun is, uh, clouds are passing over a little now, but I think that I'm going to give you a forecast of sun today, mostly sunny. And so we will remember this day as a beautiful sunny day at Moshasik Cemetery, a beautiful, peaceful day. A day that has no resemblance to another darker day in September in the year of 1934, something that uh, Professor Scott Malloy and, and Ryan have just uh, talked briefly about. A day when workers from nearby mills were chased into the cemetery and gunned down by National Guardsmen. Two people died here that day. Two more died a few days later from the wounds they sustained here in this massacre. 
and over 100 others were wounded that day here in Mushasik Cemetery. On September 3rd, 1934, almost 80 years ago, smack dab in the middle of the Great Depression, the largest labor strike in American history had been called, and over 400,000 textile workers from Alabama to Maine walked out of the mills, off their jobs, and onto the streets. Thousands of these workers who walked off their jobs in what was to be called the Great Textile Strike of 1934 were workers here in Rhode Island. And it is some of these workers we have come to honor and remember today. Depressed wages, hours cut, mass layoffs, unsafe working conditions, and abuse at work, and child labor were the complaints of workers in those days. Workers were pushed to the limit and were willing to take action to do what they had to do to improve the li their lives and the lives of their families. In Rhode Island, like in many states, tensions grew between the striking workers and the mill, work and the mill owners. Eventually, the strikers rallied against the harsh conditions imposed by the misuse of force by local sheriffs and the National Guardsmen, who had been unleashed and allowed to intimidate, harass, and assault the striking workers, claiming that the strikers were a danger to the citizens. On that dark September day in 1934, the strikers ran into the cemetery, many of them hiding behind gravestones. I imagine that they thought, as I would have, that they'd be safe behind the gravestone, that it would protect them sufficiently, at least for a few minutes. But they were being chased by armed guards with rifles and machine guns. One needs only to look around from where we stand today to see that a gravestone was not adequate to protect them, not even for a moment, from that assault. The bullet holes Still evident today in several gravestones are a haunting reminder to us of the high price these workers paid for standing up for themselves, a price that in some ways helped to ensure that future workers would be freer to join a union and have a collective voice at work, to make a living wage, and to be able to support their families, to have a reasonable work week and regular days off, so they could spend time with those families and care for their families. Their ultimate sacrifice and the sacrifice of the hundreds of thousands of workers who took to the streets in 1934, who put their jobs and their lives on the line in those turbulent times, paved the way for us, for us to fight for better working conditions, for safe jobs that pay a living wage, for a voice at work, and for time off with our families. But let's not kid ourselves. Our work is not done. As you know, there is a well-funded effort to undermine everything these four people died for and everything we fight for every day. There are those who think that creating wealth at the expense of working families is a good thing, is an okay thing to do. There are those who think that lowering the income of average Americans, increasing unemployment and foreclosures, undermining Medicare and so Social Security, while cutting taxes for the richest people and widening income inequality is a good thing and that it should happen. So we need to fight the fight every day. And I would suggest to you that every time a group of workers takes up the banner for better working conditions. They are honoring the protesters of 1934 who fought and sometimes died and made it possible for us to stand up. I say, as Scott Malloy said before me, that our battles, our protests, are how we honor these four people. Judy Kordomach, Leo Rovet, Charles Gorzinski, and William Blackwood who were gunned down right here where we stand at Moshasek Cemetery because they stood up for a better life and a decent wage. 
so they could support themselves and care for their families. I would argue that we have honored these martyrs on many occasions this past year. We have rallied and protested and picketed and fought for some of the very same issues that they fought for in 1934. And on these occasions, when we walk with workers, I think we are paying tribute to these martyrs and for what they did for us. Let me remind you of just a few occasions when we honored their memories. And you will see how today's battles are in many ways reminiscent of the battles of 1934. Jobs, wages, fairness, and respect at work. We started the year off at the State House trying to recoup $24 million taken from the developmental disabilities community in a last minute budget move. The cuts devastated the low wage workforce and hurt both the quality of care and the quality of life of the developmentally disabled. We argued that the most vulnerable should not pay to balance the budget while millionaires get tax breaks. We turned out in force in support of the airport expansion projects in Warwick. We saw this as an opportunity to create 1,300 jobs immediately. And with half of the building trades workers jobless, every job counts. We rallied at the Genesis Health Care Center over increasing health costs for workers. Employees making $30,000 a year annually were being asked to pay for up to $11,000 for their health care. The irony being that these employees worked in a health care facility and were being denied affordable health care. To call attention to the contract negotiations between unions and Verizon, we joined a national day of protest and rallied around Verizon's anti-worker, anti-union, and anti-consumer behavior. We stood with the workers at the General Cable Corporation and notified the company that their attempts to circumvent the collective bargaining agreement, especially the seniority provisions, was unacceptable and that we were not going away. We were together at the State House fighting to oppose bills to eliminate collective bargaining for public employees, opposing the draconian pension changes inflicted on teachers and state employees and other public employees, fighting to protect the job security for firefighters and other municipal employees. We worked to solve issues of poverty, hunger, homelessness, people being evicted from the homes that, they had, that had been foreclosed on. And we fought tooth and nail to get the minimum wage raised for the lowest wage earners in this state. We rallied at numerous schools and school committee meetings all around the state, from Woonsocket to Portsmouth to North Kingstown. Thank God for GPS, huh? And maybe Charaho soon, I understand, to protest, protest the unnecessary firing of teachers and the privatiz privatization of school department services. We lobbied and rallied to protect and save the American Postal Service no job too, too, too large for us, apparently, and the hundreds of thousands of jobs that would be lost if the proposed cuts were to be made by the federal government. In an effort to protect 900 jobs and create 325 new full-time jobs, we are working for the approval of table games at Twin Rivers. An additional 325 new jobs would be created through vendors and supporting organizations. We are educating members about how table games would preserve and create hundreds of millions in revenue to provide services for people in the state of Rhode Island. And it would create economic activity for small businesses. Some of you rallied with the workers at RIPTA to denounce service cuts and poor working conditions and to support funding for mass transit in Rhode Island. And we ran a campaign to make our tax structure work better by having the wealthiest amongst us pay their fair share. We lobbied, we rallied. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, maybe the wealthiest aren't among us after all, <laughs> now that I think of it. We lobbied, we rallied, we organized members and community activists and small business owners 
we testified about this issue. Our state has implemented tax policies that drastically favor the wealthiest citizens and corporations while leaving less fortunate Rhode Islanders behind. While politicians have given massive tax breaks to the rich, regular, lower, and middle-class Rhode Islanders have seen increases in local property taxes that squeeze small businesses and put people out of their homes. Seen tuition hikes, uh, hikes at our colleges and universities and funding cuts to critical programs that serve the most vulnerable among us and crumbling roads and bridges. And so you see, with just this small sampling of the activities going on this year, that the sacrifice of the strikers of 1934 is being honored every single day. In closing, let me say that between now and the next time we gather here to commemorate the actions and deaths of these four martyrs and the hundreds of other people who were injured that day, I will be thinking of them every time I see a worker or a group of workers fighting for their rights, fighting for a living wage, fighting for a voice at work. I know that what happened in Moshasik Cemetery on what was surely a dark day in September in 1934 was not in vain. And I will know that those who work against the interests of workers and their families will not be able to turn back the clock to the dark days. Thank you. Did I get it all? For, for almost 30 years, we've been celebrating the songs and the stories and the tunes and the dances of those who came here from far distant shores to build new lives and to work hard and labor on behalf of their families and everything that they believed in to make a new life and a better life. And the unions made that possible. Both Bob and I have served in our respective unions as members and as officers along the way. And we have had marvelous careers that have been made possible by the work and by the sacrifices that are celebrated here today in 1934. And so, it, at the intersection of history and the arts, we've made a song that tells the story of what happened here in Salesville. Moshasik, as has been said, is a holy ground. It's a holy land. And it was sacred long before we came here. It was sacred to the Algonquin people. And in their language, Moshasik means the marshy meadow, the creek in the marshy meadow. And this song tells the story of what happened here on a fateful day in 1934. The refrain, if you care to hum or clap along, is by, by the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, by the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, by the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, I lay my body down. Just a few bars there. Yeah. By the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, by the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow creek in the middle of the marshy meadow i lay my body down in 1934 national guard was at the mill door governor green sent them and more to lay my body down by the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow by the creek middle of the marshy meadow creek in the middle of the marshy meadow i lay my body down if the deputy sheriffs had their way the workers and the strikers would be forced to stay at the Salesville mill where they worked for pay then lay their bodies down 
By the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, by the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, I lay my body down. On a long remembered September day, strikers ran for cover where their families lay. Beneath the stones that marked their way, their bodies were shot down. By the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, by the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, I lay my body down. Oh, the marshy meadow is a holy land named Moshasik by a woodland band of the native people who took a stand then laid their bodies down by the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow by the creek in the middle marshy meadow by the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow lay my body down to all who labor and earn their keep, most Shasik is not a call to weep. The strikers shut the mill and the union did keep. We laid our bodies down. One more time! By the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, by the creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, creek in the middle of the marshy meadow, I lay my body down.